We're going to dive right in. Leviticus chapter 20, beginning with verse 1, which is a good place to start when you're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers that dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. It's a real positive note for Sunday morning. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he, have gi- he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary, profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, I'll set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. Now historically, Molech was one of the ancient Canaanite deities, this group of people that was presently dwelling in the land that God was bringing the children of Israel towards. In fact, archaeological digs indicate Molech was a bronze in statue. So if you're, if you're painting the picture of bronze, the body of a man with the head of a bull and the belly of Molech, Molech was hollowed out. Now, according to non-biblical references, the priests of Molech would stoke a fire in the belly so hot that the outstretched arms of the deity would turn a molten red. Then, in order to appease Molech and bring about a financial blessing, the Canaanites would actually sacrifice their firstborn babies by placing them into Molech's searing arms and an act of worship. The belief being that the spirit of the baby you would just sacrifice would actually return in the second child with more strength and more vigor. Once the child had deceased, the the body would then be incinerated in the belly of Molech. This act of child sacrifice was so barbaric, so demonically motivated, that God specifically singled out Molech among all of the Canaanite deities, prohibiting his people from having anything, even remotely, to do with such a practice. God was so serious that not only would the person who disobeyed his instructions be stoned to death, but a failure to report such a person would result in that individual, along with their entire family, being cut off. From the people of God. This was not something God didn't take seriously. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the point, but infanticide or the termination of a living baby, and in our context, we see this most frequently in babies that survive botched abortions. Infanticide, the killing of a baby and a botched abortion, which, if you think is crazy, it is actually the official position of every Democratic presidential candidate with the exception of Tulsi Gabbard. Infanticide. It is unequivocally an abomination to the Lord. God detests it. Furthermore, there's a warning in our passage I think we should take seriously. That God will hold the failure of His people to stand up against such a hellish act equally responsible, on such issues like infanticide, we cannot be silent. Now regarding the nation of Israel, we've already addressed the fact that there was no such thing as a prison system. Instead of time being the tool to punish a perpetrator, God's presentation of justice and this nation he was crafting required recompense be made by the perpetrator towards the victim. This was God's justice. That said, pertaining to matters or crimes where restitution was not possible, the death penalty was enacted. Within the law, you will encounter 15 scenarios justified for capital punishment. Uh, Many of them are laid out in the remainder of our passage A few of them aren't, but I'll just give you the comprehensive list. Fifteen things in God's law that would necessitate a death penalty. One, cursing a parent. We should have kept the youth in for that. Two, 
breaking the Sabbath. Yeah, God took that seriously. Three, blasphemy against God. Four, participating in the occult. Five, being a false prophet. Six, adultery. Seven, rape. Eight, incest. Nine, homosexuality. Ten, bestiality. Eleven, kidnapping. Twelve, idol worship. Thirteen, sex before marriage with someone other than your fiancé. Fourteen, bearing a false witness against someone in a capital punishment. And fifteen, premeditated manslaughter. Uh, Fifteen things in Scripture you'll find justified for capital punishment. Verse 6, and we're going to see some of them in our text. The person who turns to mediums or familiar spirits, divination, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Parents, you might want to just highlight that. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Now, in God's economy, the family structure was foundational to societal stability. Like so much so that the way everything was crafted is that parents would be held responsible for the actions of their children, yes, even their adult children. It was all intertwined. The last name literally mattered. For example, if a child ran up a debt, some bad business practices, and couldn't pay, well, the burden to satisfy that son's debt would revert onto the dad, the parent. Like at any point, legally, you could go after the parent for the sins of a son. So because of this dynamic, because parents (laughs) had a vested interest in making sure their kids didn't go wayward, this dynamic of cursing a father or a mother, or, or literally trifling with, not respecting the dynamic, well, it could lead, according to this text, to extreme circumstances, consequences, if warranted. Verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who has committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. And we're going to find kind of a a repetition of things we looked at in chapter 18. So we're looking at some of the consequences of some of this deviant sexual behavior within kin. Their blood should be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 13, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, and we've addressed that, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man marries a woman and her mother, well, that's wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that that there may be no wickedness, among you Now, in Hebrew society, the only death sentence, like the, the mode of carrying out a death penalty, was stoning. Uh, they didn't burn people at the stake. So this reference that we find here, this phrase, they shall be burned with fire, it, it likely implies that after stoning, their bodies wouldn't be given a proper Jewish burial. And, and in a way, they, through their burning, their memories would be scorched from the earth. It was like what you've done was such an abomination. Not only is this a death penalty, but then we're going to burn your body and there's no, like you're gone. Like you're just, you never existed. It's it's kind of the idea. It was such a detestable thing. Uh, Let's just wipe their memory uh, from the earth. Let's scourge them with fire. Verse 15, if a man mates with an animal, he shall be put to death and you shall kill the animal. Poor animal. If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, so this is a sister either uh, full-blooded or half, half half-sister, sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it's a wicked thing. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people, or, or literally kicked out of the camp. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. His He shall bear his guilt, verse 18. If a man lies with a woman during her sickness, which would be an unclean bleed, and we've talked about that uh, previously, and uncovers her nakedness, he's exposed her flow. Don't you love the, the language of Leviticus? And she has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. 
You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister. So that's, that's your hot aunt on your mom's side. Nor of your father's sister, that's the hot aunt on your dad's side. Uh, that would be to uncover his near of kin, they shall bear their guilt. Uh, if a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. Which kind of implies a, a, a unique judgment of God in this particular dynamic. Uh, if, a, if a man takes his brother's wife, it shall be an, an unclean thing. He's uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall also be childless. Verse 22, I told you we were going to go fast. You shall therefore keep all my statutes, the Lord says, and my judgments, and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. You shall not walk in the statutes of the nations which I am casting out before you. This would be the Canaanites. For they commit all these things, which he's just described. Therefore, I, ab I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land. And I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. This phrase, milk and honey, uh, it, there's some imagery there. L literally, it's, it's a, a land of abundance, milk. And honey, provision, sweetness. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any of the living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. Verse 26, and you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I've separated you from the peoples. That you should be mine. Again, this idea of, of the separating, the consecrating, uh, the making distinct for his purpose. He said, God, this is the nation God would indwell. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has a familiar spirit, well, they shall be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood be upon them. Now, when it came to certain violations of God's law, the point was not aimed at reforming the sinner, but instead resisting sin. That was the blueprint, especially when it came to sexual sin. From these things becoming normalized or accepted practices in Israel, this is why God dealt so extremely with certain things. And the warning was crystal clear. While God was giving them a land that was flowing with milk and honey, a land to inherit, a land to possess as his people. If they allowed, as his people, certain behaviors to go unchecked, to be normalized, well, God says in verse 22 that the land would vomit them out. And before we move on, there are two ideas within this text that need to be uh, mentioned expounded upon to a degree. At uh, first, <clears throat> there are certain types of crime, crimes, that people can't rehabilitate from. I know that that's kind of an unpopular idea within our, our particular culture, but I the data shows that the recidivism rates for certain types of sexual sins, well, it's astounding. That there are some lines drawn within humanity that once crossed, you just don't really come back from. Which means that in Israel, this entire system of justice, that yes, included a death penalty for certain things, it existed for really four reasons. One, the death penalty was there to punish the wrongdoer. Now, before you kind of revolt a little bit at the idea of death, being the consequence of sin, um, do you know that the Bible talks about death being the consequence of all sin? Your sin and mine. Like within the framework of Scripture, the idea of death, the result of sin, well, it's kind of foundational all the way back to the Genesis narrative. So first and foremost, this is just death because of sin. This is the consequence of a decision. God was clear up front, don't do these things. If you do, this is, the, this is what happens. So if you did it, my aunt was just beautiful. Well, bummer for you and your aunt. The, the second reason is that this concept of the death penalty, aside from punishing the perpetrator, it also provided justice for the victim. And, and remember, 
the majority of the of the the ethics of Israel centered on, you know, again, time not being an adequate punishment, um, restitution. So the majority of crime, it was just now you had to make restitution. You had to make make it right. You had to fix your problem. Sometimes you had to pay even more as a result. But with certain things where there was no way you could possibly give back what you had taken. Think of rape in that sense, or even adultery. Taking something you had no right to, something you can't make restitution concerning, well, death was the result, providing the victim a measure of justice. Three, and I think pretty obviously, <laughs> the idea here, again, is to deter these behaviors. That's why God's kind of extreme. This can't be part of my people. You're mine. These type of perversions can't exist. It can't be tolerated. It can't become a thing. So it's, it's designed to deter. And finally, the death penalty was there to protect the larger population from a perpetrator who would likely strike again. So it was this larger bit of, of protection. Now, you can argue um, against capital punishment and our legal framework. We, again, are not Israel. And, and I think that there's some merit back and forth. The one thing you can't do is say that the Bible doesn't promote the death penalty. Or I would just advise you not get overly moral on whatever your position is either way. The other thing I must mention from the text that strikes me is specifically regarding adultery. Like, I can't help but think about Jesus and the way that Jesus applied this chapter to an interesting exchange, a story recorded for us in John 8, when the Pharisees and the religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus, to trip him up, to get him to do something, to violate the law in some way, they bring to him a woman caught in adultery. Remember the story. And they throw this woman at Jesus' feet. Interestingly, they, they didn't bring the other member of the party, just the woman. This was a setup. And how does Jesus apply this chapter? He doesn't violate it in any way. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes the comment, he says, you without sin, you cast the first stone. Let's do this. But she's, she's an adulterer. She should be stoned. Let's do it. So whoever's righteous among you, you throw the first one. And obviously they couldn't. Jesus is, is, is highlighting the hypocrisy of it all. And then we're told that Jesus stoops down in the sand and he writes something. We don't know what it is. But the interesting thing is, who could legally have stoned her to death? Jesus. Who was the only person there without sin? Jesus. Jesus could have stoned the woman to death. But instead, what does he do? He forgives her. And he demonstrates grace to her. But then he instructs her, right? Go and sin no more. Again, not violating the chapter, but applying it, I think, in a very unique way uh, that has a lot of implications. I'll let the Holy Spirit uh, do his thing with that. Now, transitioning to chapters 21 and 22, we find ourselves entering a section of Leviticus that specifically deals with the conduct and character of both the priests as well as the high priests. These men were the representatives of God. They were to live out this holiness. They were to be examples. They were called to a higher standard. The priests were to live their lives in such a way that the people could model themselves after that. Living examples of holiness, the priests were called to be. Modeling the life God had called them all to live. Now, mo what makes these two chapters relevant for us? What makes it a relevant piece of Scripture? Is that as we've mentioned before, you and I have received an identical calling. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're actually called, as New Testament saints, Christians, believers, followers of Jesus, we're called both a royal and a holy priesthood. We are priests. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, the Apostle Paul, as us being priests, encourages his friend, and by extension all of us, to be an example in the world. 
he says. An example in word, what we say and conduct, how we live, and love, how we treat others in spirit and faith and impurity. So as we go through this text dealing with the conduct, the character of priest, and then the high priest, keep in mind you're a priest, so this is applicable. And Jesus is our high priest, which means we'll learn some interesting things about him as well. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the priest, the son of Aaron, and say to them, none shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother, also his virgin sister who is near to him. Who has no husband, for her he may defile himself. Otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not, speaking of the priests, make any bald places on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God, and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God, therefore, they shall be holy. Now, because contact with the dead would make a person ceremonially unclean. Now, this wasn't a big thing. It, it, the ceremonial uncleanness would just last for a day. You were unclean until evening. But the priests, because they had an important job to do around the tabernacle, this first stipulation was that they weren't to come into contact with a dead body, therefore being unclean and not able to perform their duties in the tabernacle. The, the exception is a close relative. So the death of a close relative, that would be an exception, because, well, if it's your mother or your father, man, that was a heavy thing. And in such a case, if such an interaction was unavoidable, so you, you had to plan the, funer the funeral, it would happen that day. Um, their grief over the dead, as stipulated by the Lord, well, it's to be different. This is the idea, different from the way the pagans mourn the dead. The idea of, of the shaving of the head and the beards and the cuttings of, of the flesh. These were pagan practices associated with the dead, often the worship of the dead, paganism and whatnot. And so God's like, if, you ha if it's not a close relative, well, you, you, you should just keep about your tasks. But if a close person dies and you have to go, just don't, don't mourn like the other nations. This is what God's getting at. You'd be articulating the wrong message. Now, the application for you and I, as a priesthood of believers, is that as we're living out our faith in this lost world around us, the truth is that you and I should handle death much differently than the way the world does. D to this point, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, he said that we're not to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep or died, lest you sorrow or grieve or mourn like others who have no hope. Paul adds, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. I Meaning there's resurrection. Death is not the end of life, so don't treat it as such. Now up front, because God didn't create humanity to die. You realize that you, you weren't created to die. That wasn't part of God's blueprint for mankind. And the truth is that death, we're told, was the consequence of sin. So death entered the human dynamic, the human condition, as a consequence of sin. So death is foreign as far as our biological makeup. Meaning, because we weren't designed to die, we also weren't equipped with the ability to cope or deal or handle death. Death is a complex thing for us. The, the, the truth is that when, when you face the death of a loved one, you're going to go through, what, what do they say, five stages of grief. Why? Because your body's so desperately trying to figure out some way to deal with this loss, but everything your body's trying doesn't work. Which is why you'll go from anger to sorrow to depression to a bit of joy. Like you go through all of these things because your body's like, i got to figure out how to deal with it. And what happens? And none, none of it works. And you just get over it. You just move on. You have to cope. There's no remedy. And yet, a Christian, you and I, we should not view death as the world does. You see, you serve a God who conquered death. Do you, do you know that? Who was victorious. He not only said what was on the other side, 
He said he'd help us get to the other side. And to validate everything he said about it, he went there, died, and came back to life, proving, substantiating everything that he said. I'm trustworthy. I can give you hope because I've been there and I've come back and I can take you. Blessed assurance. One pastor uh, that I listened to, going through his commentary, he recounted an exchange that he had with a friend. Now, uh, this pastor had experienced a tremendous loss. His daughter died. 16-year-old daughter died in a car accident. And at the funeral, the, the, the friend, this man, approached him. And he said, and you get it, you probably uttered similar statements. He, said, he says, man, I am so sorry that you lost your daughter. I'm so sorry. But his reply was, loss? I didn't lose her. I know exactly where she is. She's with Jesus. And one day I'll join her. Isn't that glorious? Verse 7. The priest shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a whore. In the old King James, a fornicator. I just wanted to get those words in. Or, he can't marry, a defiled woman. So th- this, is, this is a woman, literally this word defiled, it's, it's, a, it's a woman with a pierced, or, or just she's wounded. And, and how she was wounded, we're not really told, but that's what, what's being described. So a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman that's been divorced for her, her husband. And, and the way that this is structured is that she was driven away with cause which was probably some form of sexual sin. And there was uh, parameters for divorce in Scripture. But again, it was often in regards to adultery. And so uh, the, the prerequisites here are, are, are harlot or a defiled woman or a divorced woman. For the priest is holy to his God. Therefore, you shall consecrate him. For he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you. For I am the Lord who sanctifies you and holy. The next stipulation for the, for the priests Involved the kind of woman he decided to marry. Like like God's clear that we as a priesthood of believers, well, we should avoid marrying someone who doesn't share our moral convictions. Like it becomes oil and water and it doesn't work and it causes incredible strife. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, Paul advises believers not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. A single person. I cannot stress enough the wisdom in what I'm about to say. Ladies, avoid players. That's the application of the text. And fellas, avoid hoes. That's what the Bible's saying. Furthermore, furthermore, don't ever go into something thinking, well, I'll change them. I'll change them. Here's why. You can't change anything. You can't change yourself. How are you going to change somebody else? Now, that's not to say that Jesus can't change them. But before you say I do, you should wait until God's done his thing. Just good advice. Verse 9. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire. (laughs) That's heavy. Now, in Leviticus 19, verse 29, the previous chapter, God said to all of the fathers of Israel, He said, Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. Now, in, in our commentary on that verse, I noted that God here is calling fathers to hold their daughters to a holy standard of modesty. Not only does that protect her, but it safeguards the larger societal framework from falling into a a decadency. Now, in this situation, and again, in the context that she's behaving against the wishes and the influence of her father, this daughter is acting purely of her own volition. She's in rebellion. Because of the effect that this had on her father's reputation and the societal rot that she's bringing with this, behavior because prostitution was forbidden the woman could be stoned to death 
That's what God says. And again, her body would be burned with fire so that her memory would exist no more. Now here's the application. This is kind of a tricky one. (laughs) Because a child's behavior is a reflection on their parents' reputation. And in some instances, let's be real, it is a poor and unfair reflection. You can't be responsible for everything your kids do. But because of the dynamic, it becomes incumbent on parents to deal decisively with their wayward children. That doesn't mean you stone them to death. But maybe you say you're going to have to start carrying some of the load. You're going to have to start paying some bills or rent. You're 33 living in the basement smoking weed. It's time to grow up and be a man. You're not turning Halo into a career. I can't continue as a parent substantiating your behavior or validating it. Don't burn them with fire, but maybe light a fire, if you know what I mean. Parents can't control their adult children. But the acceptance of ungodliness and the enablement of behavior that is on you in certain situations. Verse 10, he was the high priest among his brethren. So so now God's going to take the stipulations for the priests and now apply them to the high priests. On whose head the anointing oil is poured and who is consecrated to wear the, the garments. So he's on duty, the high priestly garments. He shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. In in the context here is dealing with death. Nor shall he go near any dead body nor defile himself. Even for his father or his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Now, in a practical sense, a, a concession was made for the normal priest regarding the death of a close family member. Why? Well, there were other priests that could kind of pick up the slack uh, around the tabernacle. That being said, because there's one and only one high priest, when he's on duty, he has to remain on duty. Even if it's the death of a close family member, what he's doing, how he's representing God, his role in this system, he can't leave it. I like a great example of this. Uh, If you go back to Leviticus chapter 10, Aaron, day one on the job, two of his sons are killed with fire. They had offered profane fire. God smites, smites them. Moses comes in. He's like, Aaron, you can't mourn. You can't grieve. you got to finish the day. It's a good example of this in practice. Now, in way of, of application concerning the larger typology, again, keep in mind there's only one high priest. It's not you. It's not me. His name is Jesus. So we're going to learn a few things about Jesus in, in the Uh, The instructions here, verse 13, the high priest shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as a wife, nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. As high priest, what this tells us is that Jesus, there's only one bride that Jesus can marry. A virgin bride, a pure bride. And and writing to the Corinthian church, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12, he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you to him as a chaste virgin to the Lord. What's amazing, and again, we'll move on. As part of the bride of Christ, what it tells us is that Jesus sees you as a virgin bride, pure and undefiled. You're like, but, but do you know me? <laughs> Jesus has made you white as snow. He's taken what's red, cleansed it. How, how awesome. For the sake of time, I want to skip over the remaining portion of chapter 21. We'll, we'll get back to it. I want to switch to chapter 22. So let's go to chapter 22, verse 1. We'll come back finish our time together at the end of 21. Uh, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, that they may separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, that they do not profane my holy name 
by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he has an uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or is experiencing this judgment of God, Sariath, or has a discharge, shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. Whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has an emission of semen, making him unclean. Whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who has touched any of these things shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings until he washes his body with water. So as a priest, you're going to be in this world. Some things are going to defile you. Uh, Man, that's why we need the constant cleansing of the watering of God's word. Verse 7, when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterwards, he can eat the holy things because it's his food. Whatever dies naturally or is torn by beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself with it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my ordinances, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby. If they profane it, I, the Lord, sanctify them. The, the idea being articulated by God in these verses is really, if you boil it down, uh, priests, <laughs> Practice what you preach. Don't preach one thing to the people and then live another way. Uh, The message you've been giving, it's it's just as much for you as it is for them. Keep that in mind. The priests were not entitled to live by a different set of rules or standards. Because the priests, however, practically lived off various offerings that were considered holy. That's how they ate. There were here restrictions as to who could share in these things with them. It's, it's, it's what we're going to get to here in verse 10. Uh, the Lord says, no outsider shall eat of the holy things. These are for the Levites. One who dwells with the priest or a hired servant shall not eat these things. But if the priest buys a person with money, he may eat it. Now, now this word buys implies that the priest was a redeemer, um, which we'll get to the kinsman redeemer. So it's, it's not necessarily a a reference to slavery as we would consider it, but the redeeming of a person that was in slavery, now you're part of their household. If a person buys the person, he can eat of the holy things. One who is born in his house may eat his food. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider or a non-Levite, uh, she may not eat of the holy offerings. because She's part of a different tribe now. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced, had no child, so no heir, Then return to her father's house, as in her youth. Well, now she can eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. Verse 14, and if a man eats the unholy offering unintentionally. So this is an accident. You're hanging out with your priest buddy. You go into the fridge. There's a lamb chop. You didn't know it was holy. You grab it out for a snack. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, the application is that you shall restore that lamb chop to the priest, and add one-fifth to it, so an extra 20% making restitution. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. Interestingly enough, you want to take anything from, from these verses. Even a violation of God's law committed in ignorance unintentionally still carried with it consequences, as if you had done it intentionally. Verse 17 And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his freewill offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering. So now there's some stipulations concerning the offerings. You shall offer of your, number one, your offering had to be of your free will. It could be coerced. You had to do it of a free will, free heart. Had to be a male had to be without blemish, from the cattle, the sheep, from the goats. Again, Jesus, not only the high priest, not only making the burnt offering, but is the burnt offering. So we're maintaining kind of the typology here of Jesus, this picture of Jesus. Jesus went of his own free will. He was a male, the firstborn. He was without spot, without blemish. Verse 20, whatever has a defect, though, so of the offering, if there's a defect, don't offer it. It shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or of a free will offering from the cattle of the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Now, and we're going to get a list of defects. Verse 22, those that are blind or broken or maimed, 
or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, don't offer these things to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb or any limb that might be too long or too short, don't offer it as a free will offering or a vow. It won't be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed. You know, your little spotless lamb gets run over by your tractor. You're like, that's a loss. Let's go make an offering. No, no, no. It's been crushed. Got a defect. Or if it's torn or cut. Again, why does God have to go to so, so much length of articulating what defects are? I don't know if you've ever discovered this about yourself. Uh, but we're real good at giving seconds. That's what God's prohibiting. He's like, it's got to be perfect. That I don't want that. I don't want the defiled stuff. You shall not make any offering them, uh, offering of them in your land, nor from a foreign a foreigner's hand. You shall not offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them, and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. The purpose of these details twofold. One. Because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, any sacrifice had to be perfect. It had to maintain this this bigger typological picture. Two, second person, and requiring your best, God's doing something important, and don't miss this. And requiring your best, what God's trying to do is He's trying to ensure that your attitude and giving was correct. Let me, let me try to illustrate this idea with like a non-money example. You can always tell when a person is serving Jesus at church out of a response to God's grace or if they're serving out of obligation or a sense of duty. And you know the easiest way to tell whether someone's serving because, man, God has just been so much for them, they just want to give back in some way, or the person that's just doing it out of duty. The easiest way to tell is if it's grace that's motivating you, the job you come to do is done with excellence, and you have a blast doing it. Your heart is filled with joy. But if you're motivated by obligation or a sense of duty, the job will be done haphazardly and begrudgingly. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. So he requires our best to ensure that if you do it, you're doing it from the right place and the right motivation. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, when a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother. From the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering uh, made by fire to the Lord. And so don't make an offering um, until the, the, the eighth day of the life of 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 the little cow or the goat or whatnot. I have no idea why. I've done a lot of research and I have no clue. Um, if you find out a good explanation for that, let me know. Whether it's a cow or you, don't kill both her and, and the young on the same day. Again, I have no idea why, but God stipulates it. When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your free will. On the same day it shall be eaten. Don't leave any of it till morning. I am the Lord. Therefore you shall keep my commandments, perform them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name. But I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. And in a way, this section closes by God giving three reasons that they were to obey him, the priests. He says, one, I'm the Lord. It's as simple as that. Like, if I'm your Lord, then you'd obey me naturally. Two, not only am I the Lord, but I'm the one sanctifying you. Or literally, I am the one hallowing you. Again, we talked about this last Sunday, that it's not, it's not things we're to do, but a person God's wanting to make us into. They're not do attitudes, they're be attitudes, to be holy. God is making us, he's our Lord and he's making us holy. And third, he says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Like the entire motivation for their obedience to these commands was to be what? Did they have to earn liberation? Did they have to earn freedom? Did they have to earn the right to be? No. I've done this thing for you. I've freed you from sin. I've liberated you from bondage. I've called you my own. I've done this in spite of you. And that should now be the motivation for godliness. Again, it's God's grace. 
You know the reason grace works is it motivates a man like nothing else can. Now, I have a few minutes left. Let's go back, return to the last section of chapter 21, the section we skipped. We're going to get through this. I think that this is brilliant, fascinating, powerful. If I go a little long, apologizing in advance. Verse 16, chapter 21. So going back. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has a defect. Now, we talked about defects in the sacrifice. What we're going to get now is defects in the priest. Who has a defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. And we're going to be given here a list of physical defects that would exclude you from serving in the tabernacle. Okay? A man blind can't serve. They had no handicap ramp. Or lame. Who has a marred face or any limb that's too long. A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback or is a dwarf. Or a man who has a defect in his eye or has eczema or a scab or is a eunuch. The way the old King James translates that is a man with broken stones. Verse 21, that's the old King James. Verse 21, no man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offering made by fire to the Lord. He's got a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. However, he may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect. Lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel. And it's been said, everything that's physical in the Old Testament illustrates a spiritual truth in the New Testament. This passage is a perfect example. Like the person that's being described here is a Levite. Okay, so, so they're part of the family of God, and they're part of the, the, the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. They're also a descendant of Aaron. So they're, they're an active member of the priesthood. We're told that this person <coughs> is even allowed to eat the bread of his God. So he can eat the bread, which, by the way, is holy, and is only reserved for the priests. And yet, because of these specific defects, and the word defect might be more accurately translated as blemishes, because of these blemishes, they were excluded, not allowed to serve as a priest. They, they couldn't be effective in their job. Now, in viewing these chapters through the lens of what? You and I being members of the priesthood, right? The allegory presented in this section of Scripture, <clears throat> what does it do? It actually lays out for us certain characteristics that will inevitably restrict us from being used by the Lord, from being effective as priests. Blindness. You know, spiritual blindness always manifests through scriptural ignorance. In fact, the psalmist declares, God's word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You know, people who aren't in God's word, they've blinded themselves to God's will. And in doing so, what? You've restricted your usefulness as a priest if you're blind or lame, lameness. You know, sadly, there are Christians saved by grace, but stuck in the same place. Like there's no motion to their spiritual life. They don't go to church. They don't give. They don't serve. Really, none of the basics of the Christian life and experiences are being emulated. They're lame. And as a result, they restrict their own usefulness. The Lord can't use a lame person. And then there are those who have a marred face. In the Hebrew, this word describes a person whose face has, has literally been destroyed, completely destroyed. You know, it's a tragic thing, but there are some Christians limited in their usefulness because you look at them and it's really hard to see their new identity in Christ. Their face is marred. Who are they really? 
their reputation. They restrict their usefulness. I don't know who you are. I, I can't tell really what's going on. And then there are those with a broken foot or a person that walks with a limp. You know, it's hard to run a race with a broken foot because of the hitch in this man's giddy-up, his walk. It starts, it stops. It limits usefulness, effectiveness. There's no endurance. And then there's, there's the, the, the man with the, the limb that's too long. Uh, this phrase, it's, it's literally someone with, with an extra digit. That's, that's what the actual phrase is. You have too many fingers, too many toes. That would exclude you. You know, the fact is that some Christians are not useful to the Lord because of all the extra stuff in their lives that don't matter, but stretch them thin, wear them out. And then the, how about those with the broken hand? A broken hand. He's got a weakness that limits his usefulness. The puns are coming. He has no grip on the Word of God. And therefore has no grasp of spiritual truths. He's not useful because he doesn't have a handle when it comes to the difficult things of life. And then there's the hunchback. Who's not useful to the Lord because he's always been over. He's always been over by the burden, the cares of life, the weight of sin. And, and because of his posture, his eyes are where? They're always downward, consumed with self. Not surprisingly, God has a difficult time using a person self-absorbed. And yes, it's coming. But there's a similar difficult that ar difficulty that arises with the dwarf. Aside from being small in stature, the word describes someone that's thin, that's gaunt. Spiritually speaking, th this is a Christian whose growth has been stunted. They're not healthy. They lack maturity. Again, limiting usefulness. Also excluded would be someone with a defect in his eye. In the Hebrew, this is someone with, a, with an irritant in the eye that, that prohibits focus, leads to confusion. Understand, a lack of clarity on God's mission and purpose for your life will foster uselessness. The man with eczema is disqualified. You know, this is the Christian who just always has that itch that needs to be scratched. It's a person that's never satisfied. They're never content. They're never still. They're wishy-washy. They go from one church to another church to another church, never settling. There's a restlessness that prohibits their usefulness. Then there are those with a scab. This is a person that's harboring wounds that are still festering. They're constantly picking on old hurts, never allowing themselves to fully experience the healing that Jesus desperately wants to provide. And lastly, a eunuch was restricted in their usefulness. You see, a eunuch was someone that lacked stones, man. They didn't possess the tenacity the will, the drive. Aside from that, they can't reproduce. It's been said healthy sheep reproduce. You know, when a Christian lacks zero ambition to share their faith, in the context of a great commission that we should do so, they're useless to God. You know, the thing that's astonishing about this list, and you didn't know we were going to get all of that out of that section, did you? Is that Jesus, my friend, if some of it, all of it, apply to you, if you're like, man, I've got a scab or I've got this itch and it's, it is limiting my usefulness. I've got a broken hand or a limp. I need Jesus to heal me. What's amazing is Jesus is more than able to heal you of any of these blemishes and more than able to make you useful. And do you know how? He became all of these things for you. Think about it. Jesus was blinded by the Roman soldiers as they put a satchel over his face and beat him and taunted him. He was lame as he was carried from the cross to the tomb. His face, we're told, was so marred that he no longer looked like a man. Once more, his reputation sullied by those who falsely accused him. Jesus was stretched out on the cross and a crown of thorns added 
to his brow. Nusty, rusty nails were driven through his hands and his feet. On the cross, Jesus was hunched over, bearing the weight of our sin, our guilt, our shame. His statue was dwarfed as the crowd taunted him. Jesus' eyes were swollen from the beating, so much so that his gaze to heaven was limited as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experienced the itch of the human soul tarnished by sin when he cried out, I thirst. Wounds festered on his back from the scourging, further irritated by the wooden beam. Jesus died without children or a legacy of his own. Or so people thought. You see, amazingly, Jesus would not only remain, would not remain in such a blemished condition, a blemished state, He would rise victorious, three days conquering sin, hell, and the grave. It's a truth. Some of you have blemishes that hinder your usefulness to the Lord. But it doesn't have to be that way. For Jesus came that the blind might see and the lame walk. While the world will beat you up and leave you with a marred face, unrecognizable, Jesus came to give you a new identity. Sin may have left you deformed, but he came that you might be whole. Jesus takes broken feet. He enables them to run. Weak hands, he'll provide divine strength. If you feel like the hunchback this morning, weighed down by sin, I want you to know Jesus came to liberate you from that burden. He says, my yoke is easy. and My burden is light. The dwarf. Jesus will give the bread of life. He'll give you a stature in heaven. The confusion of life yielded by sin. Jesus will replace with a clarity of vision, purpose, meaning. For the restless soul, if that's you this morning, Jesus will provide a satisfaction. You ain't got no satisfaction? Jesus will meet that need as only he can. Jesus came to heal the wounded, that scab that's festering. (laughs) And he came to make you a son and a daughter of the Most High. You see, Jesus took all of your blemishes upon himself when he went to the cross specifically to free you from any blemish that might limit you. So will you let him free you? Father, we thank you for your word.